Let's turn over here then to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and we'll read through these first eight verses as Paul is continuing to speak to the church at Thessalonica, and it's so interesting, I know I heard some people speaking about the history of, uh, really, the history of the Jews, and particularly uh, the uh, apostate Jews that had become Muslims, just like there's a bunch of Jews that became Catholics. Because in the ancient world, you know, they were going to kill off the Jews if you didn't convert and become a Catholic. And so then many Jews became Catholics and even some of them became popes. Uh, there was also, of course, when the Muslims and the Turks got moving around the world, same thing happened, especially in Thessalonica. Uh, in modern, more modern times, in the 1600s and early 1700s, there was a real movement afresh, and around the world, um, in 1666, a particular rabbi uh, that died. All these followers followed his Mr. Frank, his successor, and there were over a million of them around the whole world that were Jews that followed Mr. Frank's philosophy, and. Uh, that was established back there in 1666 and these guys had this opinion that well the more we sin and commit sin and live licentiously and have a bunch of auto wedlock babies the more God will come back quicker for us and uh, <coughs> the Turks got him by the sword and said buddy if you don't They, at first they said, we, we're going to kill you, and, and Mr. Frank talked his way out of it, and he said, well, look, which he was a great speaker, great orator anyhow, and he, said, and he outwitted him. He said, well, look, I promise you, if you kill me, you'll be killed. And it'll not just be my head, it'll be your t head too, because my people will get old and we'll, we'll eventually cut your head off. But stop and think with me, wouldn't we be better off converting and becoming Muslims? That way you don't get your head lifted off your shoulders either. And so he convinced the Turkish king that, yeah, that would be better. So, so all these supposed Jews converted to Islam. And uh, most of the ancient world there in Turkey, especially, and for sure in Thessalonica, it's amazing because I thought, here I'm listening to this and it's, where's this, where's this all taking place? Thessalonica. And so uh, they became these apostate Jews because they adopted, and 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 yet and yet here's a man and and in, and I watched this film. I sent to Brother Ed. I I was debating, or maybe I did not. I kept debating: should I send this to Ed or not? But it's fascinating because again, uh, you see a man today in in uh, Turkey, and he's explaining all this. He says he says we all know this. We that live here in Turkey, we all know this is true. He said, so, so, okay, there's my father, my grandfather, and then my father before that. And they're explaining how we all know that this is true, that this is the people that we became. And we did this so we could stay alive. It's not necessarily because they really believe in the doctrines of Allah and all that stuff, but they were Jews, and they had to conform in this manner and seem to become proselytes to the Islamic faith, or else they were going to kill them. And they knew they'd be better off staying alive than dead. <laughs> but this forced them, their practices, to become underground. And this is where a lot of the underground movements came from the fact that there's been these groups, and this is where the Soros's and them come out of this, and the Rothschilds, and you just, you know, we, these people who control all those major banking facilities of the world, therefore controlling all the nations to tell everybody what they are and aren't going to do. And uh, because it's, it's just beautifully put together. And yet to think, wow, it was right there in Thessalonica, you know, and this is what we're reading about here. So God knows the end from the beginning, and when God puts some things together, God knew the future, and God knew that, wow, even among the Turkish people, uh, what took place there in that city that uh, has influenced the whole world. Mm -hmm. So how easy it is to 
give out a gospel track this easy. You just lean over and hand it to somebody and they'll take it if they want it or they'll say no thanks and you give it to the next guy. <laughs> so the walk in life of the model church. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verses 1 through 8. So let's stand as we read these verses. Furthermore then we beseech you brethren and exhort you by the Lord Jesus that as ye have received of us how ye ought to walk and to please God, so ye would abound more and more. For ye know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from fornication, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor, not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles which know not God, that no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter, because that the Lord is the avenger. See? The Lord is the avenger of all such as we also have forewarned you and testified. So you don't have to worry about Batman or Superman. But you better worry about the Lord. Amen. Right. <laughs> For God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. He therefore that despiseth, despiseth not man, but God, who hath also given unto us his holy spirit. Amen. So let's pray. Lord, again, thank you for that great Holy Ghost of God that we have in us, that he is holy, and we should be holy as you're holy, and thank you for giving us this holy Bible, this old King James 1611. Help us to line up and, again, just reflect God's glory in our walk and our talk, and in Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. 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 So it's a very important you get the simple truth that you ain't living right if you ain't talking it. A lot of people think, well, I can walk it. I don't have to talk it. No, you can't. Because walking it means you are talking it also. Right. The Southern Baptists got in a big way a few years back. and They got in a big way saying, oh, it doesn't matter if you talk it just as long as you walk it. No, idiot. You ain't walking it if you ain't talking it. You have to talk it and walk it both. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And God will use both your direct methods and your indirect methods of being a witness for him. Number one, we see the earnest but tender exhortation. Walk and live to please God. Amen. Now, you know this song, we didn't sing it today. But we could have. We could sing it now. Amen. How beautiful to walk in the steps of the Savior, stepping in the light. Stepping in the light, how beautiful to walk in the steps of the Savior, led in paths of light. Because amen, he's the light of the world, amen. Mm -hmm. And of course, he's going to direct us in the right steps. Of course, his word should be like a lamp into our feet, light into our pathway. So live to please God mm -hmm. more and more. That's why we want to line up with the book. We've got to line up with the book because it's the Holy Ghost of God that put this book together. And he asks us to live a certain way because we can live a certain way. He's not going to ask you to do something you can't do. You can do it, mm -hmm. but you got to want to. Because most people live by their lust. That's what concupiscence is all about. Most people just naturally live by what's driving them in their lustful lifestyle and they just uh, admire in their feelings and if it feels good they think they got a right to do it keep the commandments given to you by the Lord Jesus even Paul referenced that right there when he said furthermore then we beseech your brethren and exhort you by the Lord Jesus that as ye have received of us how ye ought to walk and to please God so ye would abound more and more, for ye know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus. And so, we know we've read in Romans before how Paul talks about, yes, God's given us his commandments, and we do well to take heed to those things. 
And we notice that when Paul lists those things, it's a little bit different than the Ten Commandments Moses gave Israel. Amen? Because thank God we are living in the New Testament. And therefore, being in the New Testament, hallelujah, Jesus took care of a lot of things, nailing them to his cross. <laughs> so we see a lot of the ceremonial laws that was given to Israel to keep because they were Israel, God's Israel, and therefore he required them certain ceremonies. Uh, hallelujah, when Paul comes to re-quoting those things, he left out those ceremonial laws and just emphasized those laws uh, of morality that are in those Ten Commandments. Uh, and then secondly, the commandment of God, be sanctified, set apart to God on the inside so that the outside reflects holiness, purity, and righteousness. Amen? Amen. And so, um, it's interesting that the Bible uh, speaks so much about Godly exercise profits little, right. but godliness with contentment is great gain. Mm -hmm. Because the truth is, yeah, if you exercise something regularly, what happens? Well, it gets stronger. Mm -hmm. If you don't exercise a thing, then it's going to get weak, mm -hmm. and right. it won't do you much good. And so it is with the Lord and His work. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't care what the, what kind of athletics you're into, mm -hmm. but in athletics, Amen. You got to push yourself and push yourself and push yourself and push yourself. These boys playing basketball, they got to keep doing the jump shots, keep doing the layups, keep doing the jump shots. See, because pretty soon it's just muscle memory. Amen. Right. It's like with karate or anything else. Your body's used to doing it and your brain's used to doing it. And so all of a sudden somebody attacks you, you remember because you've been done doing the kata so many times that your arms naturally swing up and block their hit and next thing you know they're leaving you with a bloody nose because you practice and practice is ingrained into you but it takes that discipline that's what's so I so neat about athletics and why so many Christians gravitate towards athletics and so many athletes brag about their Jesus and their Savior being their what they're all about and God bless every one of them to do it because we know the media don't like it right. but it's okay because the truth is naturally because Jesus chose men to be his disciples and to be a disciple means you have to sit still for training and you're disciplined there's mm -hmm. discipline there's a continual right. training training like Joyce said in her testimony yeah that's why we go to church every Sunday we're being disciplined we're being trained we're being taught over and over and over that's the key to learning anything right. over and over and over and over and so in the Bible, we see over and over and over. <laughs> and as Paul is admonishing this young church of believers, this is the will of God, even your sanctification. God wants you to more and more be clean and, and let, let him clean you up. This is what the word sanctification means. Mm -hmm. To be sanctified means to be set apart for his use. Mm -hmm. Set apart in holiness. Now, it's not just... That, that doesn't mean now... Uh, now now that you're a believer, now we're going to go buy you a suit. Now we expect you to wear this three-piece suit every Sunday in a tie and have new clean shoes. And So you've got to keep your suit clean. You've got to keep your shoes clean because now you're a Christian and we want you to have this walk and talk and look good on Sunday. No, there's so much more to it than that. And yet there's so many churches that says they're happy to just have that. And so they end up being big, giant churches full of people walking around with suits that match their pastor or whatever. But yet they're all just as hollow as uh, graveyard sepulchers because there's nothing on the inside. They're dead on the inside. They don't really love the Lord right. and know why they're doing it. They're just doing it because their church told them to and their preacher told them to. And they're not doing it because they really love the Lord on the inside. And that's the key thing that the Lord's emphasis is and our emphasis is. You're going to be sanctified on the inside so that you let it come out on the outside. It's not enough to have it merely on the outside. So many of these churches, everybody wants to prove that they're holy because so they make sure because all these churches have big soul winning programs. So everybody goes out soul winning and knocking on doors because that's the way they prove to everybody else that they're really a true Christian and that they're really everything they're supposed to be. But the truth is, so many of them are 
whoremongers and adulterers and thieves and just wicked people. And they have a bad testimony and they've t totally muddied the waters today because so many of these people in these big churches, like even their pastors, like Mr. Hiles and several others, uh, I mean, man, these people were in court many times and should have been imprisoned, and yet their sons are and have been and, and are going, and or some of them still are. But it's, it's so, so sad and wicked. Because, yeah, so you can put on a front on the outside like you're sanctified, right. like you're clean, right. but yet on the inside be no more clean than, you know, than the dog pen. Right. You know what I mean? Right. So many people, they're so filthy. But they think, well, one time, one, two, three, one, two, three, pray after me. I, I, I said the prayer. I'm okay. I'm, I'm okay. I'm okay. No, you're not okay. Because <laughs> you're supposed to add to your faith, like Peter said. Right. Like David understood. <laughs> Amen? Yeah. And thank God we're in the kingdom of God because of the precious blood of Jesus and so someday we'll be able to get in on the kingdom of heaven when Jesus brings it to the earth but as we're walking in this earth today we need to not get sidetracked with the filth of this world and the stink of this world and get it on us as believers and so Paul's writing to these young Christians and saying now look folks this is God's will for your life now, a lot of people have trouble wanting to know, well, what is God's plan for my life? Well, your plan may be totally different than mine. Who do you work for, Sandy? Uh, Securitas. Okay, see, she works for Securitas. And uh, I don't work for Securitas. That's God's plan for Sandy's life. But that ain't God's plan for Dan. Right. See, God's plan for me is I drive the ISD bus. Right. See? His plan's different for me than it is for you. But yet, I'm in God's will. Sandy's in God's will. We're, Joy's in God's will. We're in God's will. And the Bible only mentions it a few times. But yet, praise the Lord, you can know God's will for your life. There's so much stupidity. Again, the average shallow, empty shell preacher out here is preaching all the time. saying, You come to my church and God will show you his will. Or, and they don't even know what the will of God is. Right. And what they really mean by that is the plan of God, but they don't even know they're so dumb as a box of rocks. Many times I make a comment on their sermons when they have something on YouTube, and I'll say, well, Bible, the Bible tells you exactly what God's will is for your life. And if you get busy doing God's will, then God will start showing you his plan. Because mm -hmm. I watched even a guy last week who's a former military man and he's saying how oh, well he's he loves the lord but he don't know what god wants him to do so i was encouraging him quoting proverbs 3 verses 5 and 6 and, and so forth so on and it's just the truth amen the bible tells you some things that you can know god's will in your life and if you get to doing god's will in your life then as you do god's will then of course he'll start showing you his plan for you mm -hmm. but his plan for you may not be the same plan as he's got for me but you need to do God's will. And for sure, you can be sure what is it that God wants you to do, number one? He wants you to be sanctified. He wants you to be set apart to God and holy for God. That's why he gave you his Holy Ghost and gave you that Holy Spirit so that then you could have a little more discernment so that when you're reading your Bible, the Holy Ghost can bring that Bible back to your remembrance and help you walk right and do right as you do His plan Amen. and walk down the street where He wants you to walk down the street and be His testimony for Him right there where you work with all them other people who work there. Mm -hmm. So this is the will of God, even your sanctification, the Bible says. Uh, let's just remind ourselves a little bit. Let's go to Romans 12 real quick. What did Paul say to the Romans here? In Romans 12, this little church in Rome that started out so right on, 100% living for the Lord and doing right. Though later on a great apostate church arose in Rome and became the Roman Catholic Church. But that doesn't mean there wasn't always a true church meeting in the little back alleys and down in the catacombs. Look at Romans 12 and verse 2. 
and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Amen? Verse 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And so, amen, God has an ideal plan of service for every one of his sanctified believers. Amen. <laughs> and as you line up with the word of God as you pray every day like you're supposed to as you read the Bible every day like you're supposed to God will work on you and sanctify you and clean you up more and more and you can be the testimony and witness he wants you to be let's look at first Peter 4 and verse 2 that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lust of men but to the will of God see God wants you to live according to his book according to his will and you can and as you do god's will he will show you his plan for your life so just like wog stands for word of god it can also stand for the will of god amen the will of god and so i have a note here i have a note here it says look at first peter 2 15 so we might as well do that since i'm fooling around in peter first peter 2 15 for so is the will of god that with well-doing ye may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men <laughs> amen amen then look at uh first thessalonians 5 verse 18 as you read your Bible every day, as you pray every day, and then what else? And you're giving thanks every day. Look at First Peter, or I mean First Thessalonians 5 and verse 18. In everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. It's so fascinating. There is no more than four, maybe five things that the Bible says is the will of God in your life, and you should know those five things. Because as you line up and do those things, then you'll find that sure enough, you st you're able to have a good, clean witness for God. And uh, people will see that difference and want to know your Savior. Amen. Right. And you can be what you're supposed to be and be a spiritual person, not a carnal person. Getting sidetracked and living in their sin. So Paul mentions here, yes, uh, this is little God, even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from fornication. Now what is fornication? That's just a big fancy word that means sexual sin. Mm -hmm. You know, when you're little, that stuff is no problem for you. But as you get older, it becomes a big problem. Right. And so Paul says, yeah, stay away from it, people. It's the number one temptation in the society you live in. And so stay away from it. Avoid sexual immorality. Know how to control your own body. Resist lustful passions. And so Paul warns us, amen, that every, verse 4, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. You know, treat your body right, because you've got to live with it. <laughs> and if you don't treat it right, and you end up having problems for the rest of your life, all because you couldn't live right for five minutes. That's how it is in the world. It's wicked and it's terrible. It's a sin-cursed world. 1 Peter 3 and verse 7. Likewise ye husbands dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of God, of grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. Amen. Amen. You want to honor God in your relationship. He said in verse 5, not in the lust of concupiscence. Now there's natural tendency in our bodies and in the world to go against God. 
to live by our lust, right. live by our feelings. That's what concupiscence is. Even as the Gentiles which know not God. See, Paul, uh, Paul making this reference, putting it in this manner, because even among the Jews, many of the Jews, uh, they understood these things, and so they, like Jesus said, many of the Jews, they chose to live a life uh, of a single person because they knew in doing so it was a cleaner way to live and you'd live longer and God would honor you for that. So some people had that much self-discipline that they could do such a thing and be eunuchs for the kingdom's sake, Jesus called it. And, uh, and so Paul understood these things, but yet among the Gentiles, there was nobody had any self-discipline. <laughs> And they just live lasciviously and, and, and have all kinds of, you know, bastard children and everything else. And, and that's not to be so when you become a believer. When you become a believer now, you've got a reason to live right and act right, take care of your family right. Amen. Boy, there should have been a whole house of amens on that one. Let's look at Colossians chapter 3 and verse 5. Not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles, which know not God. Look at Colossians 3 and verse 5. Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. For which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. So see, that's why we're not like everybody else in the world that lives for their things and so materialistic right. got to live by their lust and constantly feed their flesh but that's how Gentiles live mm -hmm. and that's the kind of society we live in today yeah. and it's even worse you know and then lastly number three amen the reasons for purity. Amen. The reasons for purity. Amen. Immorality cheats and wrongs a brother. Immorality will be revenged by God. Immorality is not God's call, but holiness is. Lining up with the Holy Ghost of God. Lining up with the Holy Bible. That's what God wants us to do. Immorality is a sin against God, a sign that a person rejects God. The Bible speaks of a man taking care of his own house. If he doesn't, he's worse than an infidel. That's a sign that he's a person who rejects God. Just like God takes care of us as children, well, we automatically should understand that we ought to be taking care of ours then too. Amen? Because he set for us the right example. And so that's what Paul says here, thirdly, number six, verse 6, that no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter, because that the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also have forewarned you and testified. For God hath not called us on uncleanness, but unto holiness. This is why the government's gotten involved in divorce, marriage, and remarriage, because if people just naturally were left to do what they do, we'd be like we are in the Philippines, like we've been there, and see all these kids with no parents. We see all these men and women living lasciviously and and uh, in concupiscence. The next thing you know, there's all these babies being born, and they don't want to fool with them. They just want to go see their buddy, go down to the bar. So they just leave the kids in the streets. And brother... Uh, Danny has got, gotten into a ministry of going and feeding these kids and trying to take care of these kids and put them in a Christian school in their church and try to be a rescue for some of them because there's so many of them that don't have any mom or dad to look after them. This is what happens in a naturally Catholic town like they have over there in uh, Cebu City in the Philippines. Only people who know the Lord can get some discipline and understanding and understand the importance of taking care of your family and loving your family taking care of your children amen and your wife and your children but the world at large runs rampant with immorality and lasciviousness and so the bible warns us yes 
the world is caught up in this uncleanness. Now, it's interesting that he said, yep, yeah. verse 8, he therefore despises, despises not man but God, who hath also given us, us, given unto us his Holy Spirit. Now, since he's given us the Holy Spirit, amen, Jesus said, I'm not going to leave you comfortless. I'm going to leave, but now I'm not going to leave you totally because I'm going to send my Holy Spirit to you and the Spirit's going to come to you. He's going to be with you and he's going to be in you. And when Jesus said those things in John 14 and 15 and 16, uh, it's wonderful. Because again, we have God's presence with us. And so many times mm -hmm. as we're going along, we can be talking to God anytime we want. We can pray and talk to him. And it's easy to pray and talk to the Lord and have yeah. fellowship with the Lord. Even driving down the road in a bus. Right. Because we have the Holy Ghost with us. And he's even in there praying for us sometimes when we don't know how to pray. <laughs> Especially when you're sliding on the ice. Amen. And so, one of the reasons he mentions it here, because again, we're talking about how we're to live in the world and have a good, clean testimony for God. And keep in mind that in the end, God's the avenger. So, no matter what happens to us, in the end, God will fix their wagon if they need it to be fixed. Amen. And yet, praise the Lord, he's given us his Holy Spirit. And what is the Holy Spirit? But that is the idea that God's given us the Holy Spirit. And if you've ever read your Bible, especially 1 Corinthians 12, Paul mentions nine different gifts given to the church by the Holy Spirit. See, He's given us the Spirit, and it's the Spirit who's a giver out of gifts too. <laughs> So, man, we ought to know then all the more how we can be a witness and testimony to others and be a giver to others because we have the Holy Ghost in us who gave them, who gave us life, and we can give them life and give them some hope. And whereas in their life and walk and in their families of sin and debauchery, when they look at us, they can see a little hope and want to know more about it. Amen. I love this picture of Moses and using him for my picture because. What was it God said to him when he spoke to him out of the burning bush? He says, Moses, take your shoes off, Moses, because you're on holy ground. Amen. Right. See, when you approach a holy God that talks to you via the Holy Scriptures, written by the inspiration of the Holy Ghost God, the Holy Ghost of God, amen. You just can't walk this way everybody else walks. And he ain't interested in your stinky feet. Dirty feet, having them dirty shoes on. Take them off. Amen. Take them off. Stay grounded in God's truth. Amen. Amen. You don't need them old stinking shoes on there. Someday I'm going to heaven. And I used to sing that song. I got shoes, you got shoes, all God's children got shoes. Because when the Negroes wrote songs about heaven, they thought, well, Man, all we living down here in the south, walking barefoot all the time, the master's got shoes and boots. And, but us poor slaves, we ain't got nothing. Well, someday I'll have it all. I'll be a rich man walking on gold streets. So I love that song, and I would sing the song quite often because my grandparents sang it. But lo and behold, little Jared one day, he's about three or four years old, he said, Dad, we ain't going to have no shoes in heaven. I said, what? Really? How, how do you know that, Jared? He says, because God says, take your shoes off, Moses. You're on holy ground. <laughs> I thought, ain't that something? Out of the mouth of bays, thou hast perfected wow. praise. Amen. And that's been a blessing to me ever since. And uh, if, if you ever ask me to ordain you, I give you 101 questions. And on the very last question on that list is, when we get to heaven, will we wear any shoes? Because <laughs> if you can't. Because if you ain't figured out already what Jared knew when he's four years old, I ain't going to ordain you, man. Because you are educated beyond your intelligence. Amen. <laughs> Praise the Lord, man, because of Jesus. I'm going to heaven and I ain't going to have to worry about no shoes. Amen. I'll be able to walk on that nice, cool, gold streets and it'll be nice and pleasant. Amen. <laughs> I'm going to have to worry about a bunch of salt and rocks and stubbing my toe on anything. Amen. Hallelujah. I'll be looking forward to that. All right. Well, let's all stand by our heads in prayer. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for these wonderful truths. 
that you have given us, the Holy Spirit, and that's who gives out all these gifts. So we appreciate, Lord, you giving us an absolute perfect Word of God in our old King James Bible. And in Jesus' name we thank you now. And amen. All right, sit back down. My last page. <laughs> Get in such a big hurry that I don't show you my, uh, my numbers. Amen. Okay, so please God is four times in the Bible. Now, isn't that interesting? I bet you that's a good sermon too. Now, will of God is found in the Bible 22 times. Sanctification is five, which makes sense, you know, number for grace and could be the number for death. Sanctification is five times in the Bible. Abstain is six times. Honor is 146 times. Woo! But yet concupiscence is only three times. The Gentiles, 118 times. No, not God, two times. The Avenger, eight times in the Bible. Holiness, 43 times. Holy Spirit is four times in the New Testament, which you know I've always referenced this. Well, the word Holy Ghost is, is 90 times in the Bible, but yet Holy Spirit's only four times. Again, if these new translations were right and always translating it Holy Spirit, you'd think they could get to the fact that no, Holy Ghost is different. That's why that's 90 times and Holy Spirit's only four times. And yet to think it's only three times in the Old Testament. Isn't that interesting? Now again, we're not just dealing with the word Spirit, just Spirit by itself. You know, we'll get that number later. <laughs> Uh, so that's fascinating that the word Holy Spirit's in a total of only, what? Seven times in the Bible. Four plus three is seven, right? Brotherly love is three times. Well, there's a simple sermon ready to from somebody to preach. Love one another is 13 times. Macedonia is 28 times. And increase is found in the Bible 88 times. Very good. Any questions or anything? 